Okay, so we will be streaming this. Um, and I guess it's 10 a.m. so we might as well officially start as others um, start to join us. So good morning. I'm Christina Dillabo. Oh, just a second. Here we go. I keep forgetting that when you stream to YouTube at the same time as you're doing Zoom, you got to close out that little browser window. Otherwise, you're hearing yourself while you're streaming. Not fun. Okay, so uh, I'm Christina Dillabo, Director of Communications for the Desert Southwest Conference. Today's webinar is a follow-up opportunity to ask our virtual choir experts questions about starting a virtual choir. Uh, step one was to use the resources available at dscumc.org slash virtual dash choir. If you're starting a virtual choir journey here with this Q&A webinar, uh, please know that you are going to find additional resources. You'll be able to do a super deep dive into this stuff that we're going to be talking about uh, by visiting dscumc.org slash virtual dash choir. So this webinar is getting recorded uh, and simulcast into YouTube. Will be a, and it will be available, the recording will be available at that same page, dscumc.org slash virtual dash choir. Our panelists today include Joshua Elder from First UMC in Phoenix, uh, David Topping from Song of Life, Megan Brunton from Journey UMC, and because Jake Scott, Garen from Desert Spring couldn't make it today. I will respond to your questions about Final Cut Pro, but disclaimer, I've never done a virtual choir. So my responses are specifically about the program, uh, but his recording of how to use Final Cut Pro for virtual choir, it's great. It's on that same page. All right, thank you panelists. Thank you so much for volunteering to share what you've learned through your training videos or step-by-step -step articles and for uh, agreeing to participate in today's Q&A webinar. Uh, so let's take a couple minutes uh, for the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with, just because I can see you from left to right, David Topping first, then Megan Breton, and then Joshua Elder. Um, just say who you are, what church you're from, and what it is that you do for your church, how that got you started on this virtual choir journey. Go ahead, David. All right, so you know my name and I'm a clergy spouse. My wife is uh, the pastor of Song of Life United Methodist Church in Queen Creek, Arizona, the far Southeast Valley. And I am I do whatever she needs me to do, um, whatever somebody else at the church already isn't doing. And that included starting um they didn't really have a traditional music program when we got there so not, not a choir not handbells um they had a praise band i joined that uh but now we also have or had choir and handbells <laughs> pre-pandemic um they're kind of on hiatus right now so i'm not actually doing a virtual choir right now um that is a possibility and I, i'll be working with my choir members on options as things move forward um, however what i am doing is a virtual praise band and um that's so it's like a virtual choir and sometimes we even do acapella stuff so without the instruments uh, but it varies and um, that's how i got involved in this virtual choir stuff although I had been, as a choir director, I had been uh, very much aware of the technology and the capabilities of doing things virtually, uh, because, for example, Eric Whitaker, a very, very famous conductor and composer, has been doing wonderful virtual choirs for many years now. And I also sing in the Phoenix Chorale, a professional choir here in Phoenix. And although vir doing virtual choirs is not really our specialty, we will have a few uh, virtual Christmas carols on our upcoming uh, virtual concert in December. And David, you're gonna respond to questions about 
a cappella. The about. yeah, so there's a, the app that we're using to to do the virtual uh, praise band pieces is called a cappella or the a cappella app. <laughs> and for those who are aware of what a cappella is, they spell it wrong. Uh, on the app. But anyway, um, it, it, it's it's a very popular app for um, iOS for uh, so uh, iPhones and iPads. Um, unfortunately, not for Android, and that's what I have. But it, it it's very popular uh, among especially people who either like singing with themselves. So like you could, and it looks like a Brady Bunch. So it's little little squares or little cells that contain different people singing and the thing is they don't do it all together at the same time they record their parts in sequence and then it puts it together like an like a virtual choir so acapella app i'm happy to answer any questions about that all right thank you and megan please tell us about yourself and what you will be answering questions about Hi, I'm Megan Brenton. I am music director at Journey United Methodist Church in Las Vegas. Um, and pre-pandemic, uh, we had, like David, um, a choir and a praise band. Um, and I played uh, music for services. And being a musician, as most of you probably are, if you are looking towards doing a virtual choir, um, you know that we all kind of fall into tech category by necessity as well. People always assume, oh, you do music. You must know how to set up the sound system. <laughs> you must know how to record this thing. Um, and, and so I think just like everybody else, I had kind of gathered these little bits of, oh, okay, I'll figure it out um, by, you know, thrown into the fire. Uh, and it was no different when the pandemic hit. Um, I switched kind of roles in my church from being the music director who really just facilitated doing music things to being the person that compiled our online worship video. Um, so I kind of gather all the videos as well as working with our praise band. I'm in the same boat as David is where we do um, weekly videos with our praise band more often than we do with our choir. So I'm compiling those as well um, on a weekly basis. And it did not start out that great and that easy in uh, March when we started. And I feel like every week I learn something new. Every week it gets a little better. Um, and so I'm excited about, you know, the possibilities of where this all is going and where it can go. Um, we have done one virtual choir piece that I did early on when the pandemic first hit, and we are now working on a second one for Christmas. Um, as I think everyone is kind of finding out, the more people you have involved, kind of the longer the process is. And so we tend to do more videos with smaller groups of people, four people, five people on a weekly basis and save those larger things for our special occasions. Um, I work mostly with Mac products. I have an iPhone and an older MacBook Pro. It's nothing fancy or super fast. Um, it doesn't have a ton of storage space on it. <laughs> I've been buying external hard drives like crazy. Uh, they're my new thing on my Christmas list. Get me a new external hard drive. Um, so what was I going to say? Ah! Programs. Oh, programs. Uh, so I've been using all of the Mac products, GarageBand, iMovie, um, and then another program called Movavi that I downloaded off of the internet. It's the only paid program that I downloaded. I've been doing things kind of the harder way, I think, on my end, but the easy way for some of my older musicians um, where they record themselves on their phone and just send me the video. Um, so they're not downloading an app, which is in some ways easier for a lot of people to use the acapella app and in other ways maybe harder for people that aren't familiar with technology um, or don't have those smartphones. Um, but it is a little bit more work on my end as the person that is compiling the video. I also get to tweak things a little bit more doing it by hand. Um, and so if you are a control freak a little bit, and if you want to make things just so, um, maybe 
doing it um, by hand the slower way is for you. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm so happy to be here and answer any questions that I can today. Thanks for having me. Great. And Joshua, last but not least, tell us about yourself and what it is that you can answer your questions about. All right. Well, I'm Joshua Elder. I'm the Minister of Music at First United Methodist Church of Phoenix. And um, we have a large or had a large music program. Uh, we have a traditional choir, um, organ, we have handbells, we have praise band, we have praise choir, and we have lots of children's ensembles as well. Um, we've, we've just gone into creative mode um, during the pandemic, um, trying to find different ways, really more than anything else to keep people connected. Um, I found uh, that quickly I, f I fell into looking for um, really good videos that we had done in service um, already so that people could see their choir, their choir um, performing in their sanctuary. Um, and that was good for a time and I still use those on occasion. Um, but there's nothing like getting the people together in the same Zoom room and um, giving them a chance to sing together even if they can't hear each other, um, just being in community that way. Um, I've done a few, I started out with hymns with the choir because that was easy, I knew that would be easy to line up, um, easy to make tracks for them and stuff that they already know. Um, we haven't done any sophisticated music, frankly. Um, I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible because, you know, for, for choir members, without that person next to them also singing their part, reinforcing it, um, for many volunteer church choir members it's it's just not feasible and um, so the I think the most the largest group I've had participate is 16 people um, and the choir is about 40 so when I hold a rehearsal we have 25 to 30 people um, and then of those either just for time or um, I think a lot of times people hear themselves uh, recorded and they get so gun shy about it they just refuse to send it in um, which is, it's a shame because you you all know with editing, you can do a lot to make a person sound really good. Um, so uh, that's what I do. I use Pro Tools for audio um, and uh, I've used Pro Tools for a long time. I just, I, I'm a home recording person. So that was what I was familiar with. Um, I've also used um, GarageBand, which I found uh, to be pretty easy and um, accessible. I've used the acapella app, um, as David said, in the um, in the uh, the style of the Brady Bunch there myself to sing a couple to lead a couple hymns, uh, and it is pretty fun. The hang-up I had with the acapella app when I tried to use it with a group is that if the next person in line doesn't do it, then it's it's a hang-up and it hangs up the whole group. So I kind of abandoned acapella um, for using uh, groups. And then, um, so I mix all the audio for our virtual choirs and then, uh, and also our praise band and um, praise choir. And then I fortunately have a media person um, who does the videos. He's a, he's a, he's a total pro with Final Cut Pro. Um, and so he lines all that stuff up, makes it look great. And then I work mostly on the audio. Um, and then I, I do use iMovie um, sometimes for um, some of the college choirs that I work with. So I can answer, I mean, as much as the article that I wrote was basically about preparing a video to prepare your choir to, to submit their video. So um, that was kind of a long process of figuring out exactly um, the wording to use and what would get the best result um, for you know as people send in their videos so um that's i'm i'm happy to answer questions so. all right thank you so if again if you guys didn't get a chance to take a look at the resources on that dscumc.org slash virtual dash choir page uh joshua's article in there includes um, even example emails that you could send to your uh, singers so that they understand what you're asking for because that like Joshua said that can be a tricky thing there could be so many questions and and this whole panel has gone through this stuff so um, now is the time for the question and answers 
Uh, so attendees, if you could, please uh, try raising your hand. Let's everybody, whether you have a question or not, perfect, Joseph did it. Uh, and you do this by going to the participants, click on participants, Don, and then find your name and or actually, I believe just underneath the list of names, you'll see the option to raise hand. Okay, Don, I'm gonna put in my cell phone number in there. So in case you can't raise your hand, um, you can text me and I'll ask your questions for you or you can write your question in the chat as well. So, um, all right, I'm gonna lower the hands and now um, go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question, I'll turn on your microphone or type your question in the tech, in the chat. All right, Joseph, go ahead. You'll need to unmute yourself. There we go. Okay, I'm Joe Patanzo and I'm, uh, I'm at St. Francis in the Foothills United Methodist Church in Tucson, Arizona. And uh, I had a question about uh, the last gentleman and I'm horrible with names, please forgive me, but uh, uh, I loved all of your comments and, and uh, very familiar with your your church that your music minister at. When uh, when you're using Pro Tools like that, uh, of course that's it's it's much easier, uh, of course, to kind of do that audio editing in a in a big package uh, uh, DAW like uh, Pro Tools. When once you've got that finished, uh, are you saying that you're just sending out just an audio file to your video guy and uh, he's doing all the magic work of uh, aligning the mouths on the individual uh, performers to move at the same time and uh, setting the video track underneath that? Uh, it's a combination of things, Joe. It's Joshua, by the way. and, and uh, Thanks, Joshua. Thanks for, be thanks for being here. No problem. Um, yeah, so I so really the reason I mix in um, Pro Tools is because I know that the audio is going to get lined up really, really well. And there are so many effects that I can add um, and and just well, partially because I'm really familiar with it. But what the what our video person does is he still uses the audio as he's lining up the video. He's still using the audio of the individual singers because really to line up video, you want to use the audio tracks because that shows you the peaks and valleys. So to line yep. up your video, you want each person's audio still there. But then once he has that all lined up, then he, he gets rid of all that audio and just uses the main track that I have mixed. Now, I have to say, Joe, if you watch a couple of the videos, you're going to see um, the, one of the beautiful things is that you just imagine people are watching your worship from home on their computer screen. And so it's not perfect. I mean, it's not everybody's mouth is not moving at the same time all the time. Uh, if, if that was my 40 hour a week job, I could maybe do one every two weeks that was perfect. But you know, we're, we're doing a lot of stuff. So um, I would say to that point, you know, give yourself a lot of grace as you're putting, as you're, as you're beginning this process, or even as you're in the middle of doing it, because it's not going to be perfect. And you have to, at least for me, I had to accept that and just say, this is going to be good enough. And our congregation is going to appreciate seeing their choir sing. And that's what we get out of it. Yeah, thank you very much for your, your answer. Um, I'm working in a different piece of software, uh, Filmora Pro, uh, which is kind of like Final Cut Pro, but a little bit less expensive version uh, of it. And uh, there seems, no matter how well you do it, uh, there seems to be a certain amount of latency in the rendering process that causes that slightly out of alignment uh, kind of a thing with the uh, with the videos uh, going on. So uh, yeah, I can appreciate what you're saying. It's progress, not perfection. But thank you for your answer. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question, Joe. Um, so if anybody else has a question, Joseph, I'm not going to remove you from the panelist section in case you have a follow up question, you can ask away. Um, so anybody else that has a question, go ahead and raise your hand now. I'll promote you and then I'll leave you in that same area so you can speak freely. Okay, no questions so far. 
So I am curious. Uh, so you guys have all already um, been doing this for a while, whether you've done one or not exactly a virtual choir, but the virtual praise band. Um, as you went through this process and learning, what was the biggest stumbling block that you had to overcome? Even if it's about equipment. Go ahead, Megan. There we go. I got to figure out how to unmute myself. <laughs> um, so in more to reiterate what Joshua said, I, I think um, a big stumbling block that I ran into was um, affirming to my singers that we do sound better as a group. <laughs> um, like he said, I did have a hard time, um, especially with members who, you know, had been doing this for so long as a group and aren't um, as familiar with the online recording process, they would hear themselves and, nope, thank you very much. I think I will decline. Um, and so I really started um, with every announcement that went out, with every time I would call and talk to somebody saying, expect to not like your recording. <laughs> That's okay. Nobody likes it. Um, nobody likes their voice on their voicemail. So, um, let us work magic and then you can tell me if you don't want to be in it afterwards. Uh, but that was, yeah, to reiterate that, that was a big stumbling block. Um, and then also I'm finding too that as people send me their recordings, sometimes this goes back to what Joseph was saying. Sometimes the recordings that they're sending me because of the way they're recording or lag, maybe they're using a, a webcam to record, their audio is sometimes off with their video um, and even what they send me. And so kind of lining up those peaks and valleys, I have to separate it. I have to separate the audio from the video beforehand and just look at the mouths. Um, so that has been a little bit of an issue um, as well. I think that's an issue for everybody. And I am on board with what Joshua said um, in my webinar a couple of weeks ago. I kept saying, don't let perfection get in the way of progress um, because it's, it's not going to be perfect, um, but your message is still going to get through and people are going to be so grateful that it's there, even if, you know, the word doesn't quite line up 100% of the time, so. Thank you. Go ahead, David. Another uh, thing that's probably common to everyone, and this depends on where you live and whether it's really hot or really cold, but talking people into minimizing environmental noises while they're recording, such as uh, the AC, you know, having your, your house air conditioner, central air running is does make a significant uh, noise. So if they can get it as close to just absolutely silent. Oh, and I see Don Benton mentioned uh, leaf blowers. Oh yeah, well, sometimes there's not a lot you can do if it's your neighbor <laughs> doing leaf blowers. Otherwise, other than just going out and smiling and saying, hey, I'm making a recording right now. We, um, I was participating once in a professional uh, CD recording in a beautiful church with wonderful acoustics and everybody in the neighborhood seemed this was their Saturday to go out and mow their lawns and, and such and so we, we we sent out a you know production assistant to to go around it with cash to, <laughs> to to maybe offer people incentive or even an offer like hey I'll come and mow your lawn later, <laughs> whatever it takes. So anyway, uh, background noise is is significant. Again, a little noisy glitch here and there doesn't ruin everything, but the quieter it is. Also, being in a not echoey room is a very helpful thing. And so that's why some you'll see some people do virtual choir recordings in their walk-in closet with clothes because that absorbs any uh, extra sound and it makes it nice and clean for the people to edit later on. Um, one of the one of the things I feel like I've I've learned um, and am still learning uh, the first two now this pertains just to choirs virtual choirs um, the first two videos that I made I just made audio tracks um, you know to assist the people. Um, like here is your part with the accompaniment and then here is the actual performance recording that you'll sing to um, and 
as as I was listening to them and I was getting the recordings back, I started to understand or remember that choral is actually uh, choral singing is actually very visual for the singers. Um, if you've trained them well <laughs> and on their best day, they'll actually watch you. So um, in the third video that I made, I actually made a conducting video where I showed the time and I was actually conducting the organist as he was playing the parts. And that uh, came out with a much better result uh, just in terms of getting people people's timing all lined up. The other thing that I'm still struggling with um, is that you discover how people feel the beats so differently and how they emote so differently and how they stretch time and notes so differently. And again, that's because when you're not in the room together, you're not all feeling it and adjusting to each other in real time. Um, and for the next video, and I think this will, um, this will come and end up with a better result even. Um, I'm actually gonna have singers sing the tracks so that um, there will actually be a voice there that really leads you so that the people in the choir will feel like they're singing with someone. And I'm hoping that that will be an even cleaner and more precise result. Great idea. Uh, Joe, you had your hand raised again. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Joe Patanzo. Um, uh, and I agree with uh, w what was just said. I found that um, if, if I put a scratch track out that was simply uh, our accompanist uh, and just pounding the melody, uh, that still left lots of room for interpretation about vowels, how they're placed, uh, how they're developed, when the word ends, uh, how it ends. And it's the stuff that happens uh, in real time in the space when uh, musicians are together. It's that adjustment process. So anymore, uh, I only send out, a lot of times I'm, I'm working off of uh, original recordings of a piece of music. So if we're doing a a piece of music by Marty Haugen or, or something uh, to that effect. Uh, I'll send out the sheet music with the parts and, and the recording always with the instruction, uh, uh, defer to the recording in terms of uh, format and so forth. Uh, the uh, other thing that I do is a lot of times I'll bring that video into something like GarageBand, something simple and I'll, uh, I'll arm a second uh, record track. And uh, uh, after, the, after the video has begun, I'll count off two measures. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. Uh, then I'll take that and do a little bit of editing and align that as best as I can. So that count off track comes in uh, before the introduction starts, um, whatever uh, video recording uh, I'm using. I ask the singers uh, and the instrumentalists to do the same thing with that clap. And that gives me a very simple clapboard, like uh, in the old time in the movies, uh, to do a, a synchronization alignment point uh, to get everything in the ballpark. Thanks. That's a great tip, Joe. Thank you for that. Um, Beth asked in chat about, um, well, she says, we have a staffing question. Our choir director moved and took a new job in July. So we have been trying to figure out what is reasonable to expect when thinking about hiring someone to be our choir director during this pandemic time. Should we expect a choir director to know how to do a virtual choir? And uh, Megan, has gone through something like this recently. So um, Megan, could you respond to that question? And if anybody else has something to add, feel free afterwards. Absolutely. And I just tried to kind of type out a, a short answer to you asked me to reply in the chat. Um, so I, I have seen um, all choir directors really hustling to kind of get on board and learn what's going on with the new tech. I think we all understand uh, as music directors that that does kind of fall under um, our job description and the changing times, right? When the phone company went digital, uh, the phone employees, you know, you learn the new system. And so 
we're all trying to learn this new system. Some people are further along in it than others. Um, so I guess that that's something that you really have to think about as a church um, is how important is that tech portion to you? Is it important just for now? Um, because there are some really uh, stellar choir directors out there that while they might be learning, it's not quite their thing yet. And so if you um, are thinking long term, um, you're going to cut down your candidate pool, I think, by saying that you must do this tech thing. But that might be what the right thing is for your church. If, if having somebody who's really proficient um, in doing virtual choirs is of importance to you, there are people that um, are ready to, to jump on board and, and do that. Um, but it'll be something you'll have to think about because um, there are some choir directors that they're the best choir director in the entire world and they don't know anything about tech. Um, but man, you'd be lucky to have them as your music director. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, I was music director now in the tech side of it and, and we too are struggling a little bit. I'm a staff member. Um, what are, what are my new duties now as opposed to what they were before? What kind of hours are equitable, um, for the salary that I'm receiving? Um, it has been a struggle even for us. And uh, I've been kind of reaching out a little bit to different churches and groups to see what other people are, are doing in a respectful way. And yeah, it's, you're not alone. We're all kind of struggling to say, how does this equate to what we were doing with our jobs before? So. I was going to add that um, it can be outsourced because there are a growing number of online services that are good at this and hiring themselves out at sometimes fairly reasonable rates. Um, and there's now more competition. So there, um, you can even just Google uh, virtual choir services uh, and, and you'll find there's virtualchoirs.net I uh, found another one, a brand new one called planetchoir.com. I found an, uh, another one, virtualmusicproductions.net. And I just, you know, I've stumbled across those and kind of looked at what they do. And some of them have subscription based to where you're not just paying them piecework to do a particular job, but you get a deep, you sign up, uh, you know, on an annual basis or something. And, and they'll collect all those recordings from your singers. And so your music director might just have to provide the basic guidance like, yeah, we're going to do this song. Here's the addresses of my singers. And there we go. And so it's not absolutely necessary to do it in-house. OK. And Joe, your hand was raised again. So do you have a question or something to add? Yeah, I can add something to that because uh, I've actually been uh, had had to go down that rabbit hole in the past several months uh, in trying to uh, determine, uh, you know, what is just in this arena of changing job descriptions. Um, Mark Willingsworth is uh, the, the choir director uh, up at St. Mark's up in uh, uh, Denver area. And they're, they're, that's a pretty large uh, church. I think it's 4,000 plus families. Uh, up there and they they recently did a thing with about half of their choir about 78 voices um, uh, up there where they they did a um, a four song package with one of the uh, companies that uh, that does that externally uh, 78 voices uh, four pieces of music um, uh, a company that uh, played the accompaniment track, then hired a professional uh, soprano, alto, tenor, and bass to record uh, the separate parts tracks to send out uh, to the folks so that they would be able to sing along with it. Uh, and that, that package came in at $5,000, uh, which they, they put back out to the choir. I think uh, if you want to sing on a song, I think it's 15 bucks. So the choir is kind of supporting their own subcontracted stuff. I found somebody that would do, we're doing kind of more of a kind of a hybrid, kind of a praise band uh, kind of a thing uh, with my group in Tucson. 
I found somebody that would do one song uh, per week at a rate of uh, $500. Um, I, my job description went from a very, very minimal part-time uh, job. I'm, I came out of retirement to kind of help out there. Uh, maybe eight hours a week to, uh, to uh, you know, I'm doing 22, 25 hours a week uh, trying to get a, a piece of music shaped up so that it, uh, uh, it, it makes some sense. I also looked at music videographers nationally, and that's, that's got a pretty big uh, price range associated uh, with salaries, as high as $200,000, uh, uh, depending upon uh, uh, who's doing it. However, the entry level uh, for full-time bare bones uh, nationally uh, is $48,000 uh, for that, that type of a position. And, and none of those positions necessarily have anything to do with being a music director, making a planning meeting, um, uh, doing the uh, uh, sourcing of, uh, of the music, making sure that uh, uh, all the licensure uh, uh, stuff is in place, uh, dealing with the individual musicians and choir members. Uh, they're basically just editing videos and, and putting them together. So that's, that's just the recent stuff that I've kind of come up with. But basically my job went from six to eight hours to about 22, 25 hours a week. Wow. Thanks, Joe. My goodness. Um... Okay, so panelists, you all did um, either a video training or an article. Um, now that that's behind you, and again, thank you so much. I, I realize that was a lot, that was a big ask, uh, and many churches are gonna benefit from that. Um, <clears throat> but now that that's behind you, is there anything that you've found that you feel like, you know, in addition to what I shared, you should take a look at whatever. Uh, is there like a, an accompanying uh, training resource or article out there that you would recommend? Hmm. Well, sure. I'll, I'll jump in just with one. For one thing, this is related, but not exactly um, central to the virtual choir thing. And that is learning how to uh, customize and improve your, assuming you're using YouTube. Um, some might use Vimeo, some might put them all on Facebook. But if you use you, learning how to properly customize a YouTube channel to make it more attractive and accessible is a good thing because it's free. It's very easy. There's hundreds of videos out there about how to do it. It's, it's not hard. Once you get 100 subscribers to your channel, you can name your channel instead of having this really gobbledygook code. You can be like, so our YouTube channel is now uh, uh, youtube.com slash song of life UMC. And just like with a Facebook address or, you know, you can, you can actually do that. All you got to do is get a hundred subscribers is the entry level to do that. So that, that would be one suggestion. Now. Thanks. And it could be even if there's, um, like discussion groups that you guys are involved in where you found some great recommendations. Um, you know, the people that are thinking about virtual choir right now might not already be connected to those groups. Go ahead, Josh. Um, well, one of the things, and, and I think this goes back to Joe's question, earlier question about lining up um, the, the singers' faces. There, don't forget that there are more options um, than just putting... 12 people on the screen and having them sing okay um, sometimes we think like oh that's what we see other people doing because when you google virtual choirs that's what you see right you see eric whitaker's 2000 voice choir you know that's <laughs> that took somebody months and uh, probably a whole team of people to do right that's like that's like that's like watching star wars and then saying okay i'm gonna go out into the desert and shoot a film okay so don't don't fall into that trap it's a trap okay but what i want to say is um so my wife teaches at a school 
and um, there are a lot of um, a lot of restrictions on putting children's uh, images up on screen and to circumvent that they have the children create artwork they 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 they're mixing the choir together the audio side of it then they're asking the students to create artwork or poetry or to read introductions or you know any any other creative thing that they can add to the video so that your uh, your audience, if you will, or your congregation, most appropriately for us, we don't need to be entertained at home. That's, I, I think that is a trap for sure that I have fallen into and that I keep reminding myself, I is not my job to entertain my congregation. It is my job to lead my choir in experiences of community and then on Sunday morning to lead the congregation in experiences of God and worship. Right, so we need to move beyond the how does my choir look, is everybody synced up and all that, and move to what other creative ways can I engage the congregation at home on a Sunday morning, and maybe it is um, incorporating some other visual arts. I mean, our, our sanctuary is full of beautiful stained glass, and um, people, they write to us and they say, we miss the sanctuary so much, we miss the stained glass. Well, how lovely to have your choir sing, and instead of watching them sing, have views of your sanctuary, you know, in on like what it would look like on a Sunday morning. Those are things that will inspire your congregation just as much. And it doesn't have to be every Sunday the exact same thing. That is a great tip, Joshua. Thank you so much. Um, you're right. It's not about the performances. It's you know, it's, we're gathering for worship and maybe looking at the stained glass would bring people closer to that heart space, mental space of thinking about our God and creator. Um, that's a great idea. Um, so as you guys started with this virtual choir venture, uh, and have to be more online and tech savvy. Uh, was there any equipment that you found that you needed to upgrade or equipment that you thought like, I'm gonna need to buy a new camera or all new microphones or whatever. And turns out actually, you know, maybe your phone was good enough. Any equipment tips from you guys? You just need disk space. And that's Megan's external hard drive comment. <laughs> yeah, uh, one of the one of the things that I really love, and I talked about this in uh, my thing a couple of weeks ago with iMovie, um, is that it saves a copy of whatever clip you're using in the program. Um, but because of that, it's doubling uh, or copying the file every time you pull something in. And so your storage space really quickly fills up like, you know, rabbits multiplying. <laughs> um, but the nice thing is, is that it's always there. If I move a file to the trash or if I put it in another folder and I go back to open that original um, thing that I was working on, I, I never have to go and find it, which I do in other programs. And I am not very digitally organized. Um, so I did find that by copying my whole iMovie program onto an external hard drive, um, you can do that. You can move your program from your apps or from your computer directly onto that hard drive and just keeping all of the files on there. I just have to remember to plug in it every time, but my computer wasn't constantly uh, filling up. I've also really gotten into using MIDI way more than I ever did as a choir director when I was very much like, ah, the acoustic piano, the acoustic piano. And now I'm, I'm all about uh, the MIDI stuff and, and what I can do with creating my tracks um, for my choir using that. And so getting a good MIDI chord and a keyboard that connects to my computer I've um, found is newly important to me in this world. So um, one thing that I did uh, when I was tasked with making my part in some virtual choir piece projects for the Phoenix Chorale was I discovered that my own little digital recorder was getting old and it was a 
the cheap entry level one is a little Zoom recorder. And so I, I went online and I got myself a slightly better one. And, um, and so these devices like these, this was maybe $230, um, will, will record a lot higher quality audio. So if you're, if you're talking about doing a special production where you really want some high-end stuff, um, these kinds of things, and if you're recording the actual audio track separately from the video or in addition to the video, so you'll have a really high quality audio, things like digital recorders can be good. But I just saw a question in the chat um, that kind of uh, transitions us to a slightly different thing. And that is about the, what kind of licenses you need for uh, virtual choir pieces. And I just, when I was researching this Q and A session a little bit, I uh, stumbled upon a really good thorough article on the one license. Uh, website. I'll post it right now in the chat, but it's very easily accessible at onelicense.net. It's like in their blog. Um, and it, what it, it talks about pretty much the whole process, but it's, you know, the licensing is their thing. And one license tends to cover more of the choir music than, for example, CCLI. If the CCLI catalog, um, it really has very little in the way of the st stuff that our choirs typically sing, uh, choral publications. CCLI typically has a lot more of the praise music. Um, you know, they will have other things, but one license uh, does cover a number of conventional choral music publishers. And so if your church doesn't yet have the one license, um, you, you need to very much be very intentional about looking up the copyright, uh, who owns the licensing on a particular piece, just because just because you could perform these pieces all day and all night in a church service with no licensing worries whatsoever, because there is an official exemption uh, for for churches for that purpose for worship. You could you could perform any music and and as long as you're not projecting the lyrics or something, you, you, there's no licensing needed. But now that we're broadcasting these things out to the world, licensing is needed and you do need proper permission. And whether that's through a blanket license like CCLI or one license or, or others, or if you go individually to the copyright licensing department of that publisher, they often will work with you and you can obtain a license for a particular piece of music. Nice. Thanks, David. Um, and so then for those of you that, wait, can you hear me okay? Something not working right? Yes. You can hear me? Okay, good. Um, so I wouldn't feel like I was uh, doing my job as one of the panelists or a stand-in for Jake Skarin. Skarin? Okay, whatever his, his last name is. I'm really sorry, Jake. Uh, if I didn't share this one little tidbit, um, so I'm sharing my screen real quick. This is Final Cut Pro. And if I was going to in, uh, download or upload, whatever it would be called, uh, something into um, this project for whatever, um, let's just say it's this one. Uh, you'll see in this right-hand side that there's add to existing event, create new event, and copy to library or leave files in place. Uh, so if you copy to library, then it does that duplicate file thing. So watch out for that. If you do the leave files in place, then you're, you just have to be careful to not uh, move those original files. If you ever have to do any edits to this video project again, uh, or accidentally delete those files because they're eating up space. Uh, but this is where, again, the external hard drives are a great um, resource or a great process I guess, to consider. Um, Joe, did you have something else to share? I did. Uh, thank, thank you for calling on me. Um, uh, regarding uh, external hard drives, and at the risk of sounding like I'm uh, uh, promoting a company, which I'm not, uh, Costco recently had a five terabyte drive on sale for $89, uh, which is a, I think that's a pretty darn good uh, price on it. Uh, and one other quick comment uh, regarding equipment. I had a, I had a Macintosh uh, 
27 inch that back in its day uh, was uh, just about the fastest thing you could get. And as I began to load it up with some of this heavy duty processing with the video and so forth, back, back in, that, in those days, the video card, uh, the separate video card on the Max wasn't nearly uh, as strong as it is today. So even though I had a quad core i7 processor that uh, moved right along, as I started doing heavier and heavier processing, I was not able to edit and leave everything on and open at the same time because it began to hiccup. So uh, ultimately I wound up having to get uh, a much newer machine, dropped down to an i5 processor, but went from four core to six, six core uh, on it. And uh, it, that thing's pretty quick and that solved all of the problems with the heavy processing. Great. Go ahead, Joshua. Um, one other thing about equipment. Um, one of the things I did as we kind of moved into month four and five of the pandemic um, was to let the choir, I, I hunted around for some good microphone bundles, um, microphone slash USB interface bundles um, so that people could, if they wanted to, um, I can still take recordings from their phones. Um, it's totally fine. But uh, I can I can definitely tell the difference when somebody has even the, like like the ninety nine dollar Behringer uh, little bundle. It's a decent microphone. Um, it gets it eliminates a lot of the, the the noise around, and it has a USB, so it it interfaces with your computer, so you can then directly record onto your computer, and then send the files. Um, so there is a big difference in quality if you get a, an actual microphone. Um, that will interface with your computer. So even if, if your congregation, if your choir members are willing to spend $100, it does make a difference. And we might be doing this for another seven years. <laughs> yeah, Joshua, I just yeah, the bought... Built -in... Um... Oh, sorry, oh, go, go ahead, ahead, David. Go ahead. No, no, you're first. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I like you just started to buy finally for my praise team. I went on Amazon and, and did some research. Um, I had early on bought a lapel mic for our pastor to record into his phone. It's a lapel that runs into his phone. Um, and I've got a great recommendation. I can put in the chat link later for that. I had compared it to some really expensive mics that we use um, at my work. I work for a, a music school as well. Um, and this cheap one that I found for $40 worked, you know, almost as well as these expensive ones. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about Joe and his file size issue. Um, I know it seems like a really common sense thing, and I'm almost embarrassed that it took me so long as a music person to realize this. Um, my computer was also running very slow. And the more I, I worked and I realized, okay, the video was starting out this big. And by the time my process was finished, they were one of three people in a very tiny little box in the corner. Um, so now when people send me their files, I go in and I make them small before I even drop them into whatever program I'm using. Um, so they are going to send me this beautiful HD thing that they recorded on their camera and it looks lovely. Um, and then I make it like 480p before I drop it into my video processing thing and it makes everything run really fast. Um, and when I output it, it still has looked fine on a computer. So that might be an option for you as well. I was about to recommend a couple microphones just just to throw them out there that I've seen around a lot. Um, one for people who have iDevices, iPhones. Uh, so if you only have the lightning uh, port, which is not the regular headphone jack, but if you have a newer iPhone that uh, has the proprietary uh, input, the Shure, the Shure microphone company makes one called the MV Mary Victor 88. And that one is very popular and, and not too expensive. I'm looking at it. Well, it's like 150 bucks. But anyway, <laughs> it's not too much. I found one that goes into the, the standard uh, headphone uh, jack on, on a smartphone that's a tiny little one. And, but what's nice is it, it bends. And so it can point at you. So if you have your phone like this, 
and then you plug this in and it, and it kind of makes it a little directional. And it's like a $16 mic. And, and it, any mic like this in, is, tends to be better than the built-in mic in a smartphone. And yeah, this, is, this one makes it more, instead of unidirectional, like where it's picking up all the sound all around, I think this might have like a, what's called a cardioid or a heart-shaped uh, pattern. And so that rejects a little bit of background noise and echo and just makes it a, a better sound. So yeah, technology doesn't have to be super expensive. There's all, all different prices, but smartphones themselves do a good job. You know, you, you get a decent, decent quality. They do. Joe, did you have something else to add? Yeah, one of the things that I uh, noticed, uh, uh, I don't know how many people do a lot of sound stuff. I, I've done that over my life. There's uh, there's microphones that you use to um, that isolate in. There's shotgun mics for like long distance kinds of things. When when we take our iPad and when we take our our phones and we put them on a metal Manhasset music stand. Uh, we're going to get so much reflection because we're, in fact, creating uh, a shotgun mic at that point in time. And we're using that metal surface to collect the data from around the room. So, uh, you know, tell the, the folks that are not in the know uh, to try to keep those devices isolated. Uh, put them on cloth or something if they're going to use a music stand. Uh, because you get a lot of reflection when you do that. Um, one other thing I wanted to say, uh, I'm thinking back to Megan's comment earlier about sometimes the, the video and audio will be lined up at the beginning and then not at the end. You do For everybody, you do want to make sure that you're um, editing and importing everything at the same bit rate. Um, so the common are 48K, but also 40K is, uh, sorry, 44K is also very common. And if you import, if everything is running at 48 and you have one video slash audio that's at 44 um, their whole segment will be shorter and it will get done more quickly um, that's how and i just discovered that by like what the heck is wrong with this i keep lining it up and then she's done and everybody else is still singing so and then i realized but most of the the um, editing software has converters but you want to make sure you convert it before you import it in that that file into the main file. So, all right, uh, we are two minutes to end time, and I don't see any more questions. So, I'm going to go ahead and, and thank you, say thank you to all my panelists. Uh, thank you, attendees, everyone, for joining us today. Um, if your church needs a little bit more one on one help, or is interested in hiring someone to create a virtual choir, uh, please just email me. It, the easiest email address is communications at dscumc.org. I am compiling a list of uh, individuals that already do this sort of work for some of our churches. And even I also have uh, contacts for people that are not doing virtual choirs, but are doing um, video recordings of songs like sing-alongs or whatever for the church so if you're looking for something like that send me an email and uh, i'll get you connected with that person and you can talk about pricing and whatever um, so again this recording is going to be posted on our youtube channel and that website page dscumc.org slash virtual dash choir i hope you all have a great rest of your day and you know Try, try something new, give, give it a chance, try this virtual choir thing. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, just give it a try. All right. Thank you, everybody. And I'm going to go ahead and close this off.